Hello everybody, and welcome back to Space Engine. It is very green here. Alright, this is that planet with life we left off on. Are we in the Milky Way still? I don't even remember. <laughs> Anyways, it has been quite the week. And by quite the week, I mean it's just been kind of busy. And full of other things. But I am now here, waiting for my oven to cook something. And I figure, let's do a Space Engine video while I wait. Uh, for those of you who are new to my channel, and are mostly here for the science infograph videos, and aren't necessarily interested in the space engine videos, um, I kind of alternate between the two, so this has just been my schedule forever. This channel's like, what, nine years old? I don't know. No, the channel's older than that, but this these videos are nine years old. Uh, for those of you who are here for the space engine videos and don't care about the other ones, keep up the good work. And for those of you who are here for both, uh, thank you, I always appreciate it. Anyways, uh, I was asked to explore the Large Magellanic Cloud. I believe I've done that in the past. In fact, I think I have an entire episode about it. But, um, I always love going there. Why won't it- come on, come on. Fine, we'll do Magellanic. I can't see my keyboard, my, um... Mic is in front of it. I'm trying to keep my keyboard behind the microphone so you don't hear the keyboard as much because this is an incredibly. Uh... Wait, if I just do this, large Magellanic. Oh, yeah, there it is. Boom. This is a very loud keyboard. It's a very, like, cheap keyboard, too, as a matter of fact. You know, the large Magellanic cloud, I could have just found this by looking around. I didn't really have to type that in. I feel kind of dumb. <coughs> oh, well. <laughs> Right then, Large Magellanic Cloud, yes, it is a dwarf galaxy uh, that orbits our galaxy. It is a satellite galaxy. Uh, very cool place. It was where Iskandar and Gamalus are located in the Space Bash Pimato, um franchises. Franchises? I don't know. I watched the original and I watched the remake. I preferred the original mostly because it had more violence. Like, personal violence. <laughs> I don't know, it was, just, it was kind of funny watching the crew of the ship get into fistfights almost every episode over, like, little things. But I guess they were all very high-strung. Oh, look at that life. Let, 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 let's go there. I mean, I don't blame them for being high-strung. Uh, Earth's future was at stake, so... <laughs> I guess it makes sense, but just like every episode they were getting in fistfights, it seemed. Alright, um... A warm, lacustre... Lac Lacustrian Terra with life. Marine unicellular. Very nice. Uh, the sea is water. Excellent. The atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide, nitrogen, oxygen, and uh, water vapor. Oh, good God. Gravity is lower than Earth. Interesting. Temperature is very warm. Hey, 343 atmosphere. <laughs> Halo. Um... I, I prefer when Bungie did things. Anyways, that's a very thick. So it's a very thick, hot, and humid atmosphere. Uh, so basically, it's like the Midwest, United States, or Florida. I've been to the Midwest. I have not been to Florida, and I've been to Missouri. I have family that live there, and uh, I, I I hate it every time I go there. It's just I do not get along with that. Like. That humidity, that the, the hot humidity, I don't like that. I, I live in Canada. I like cold, dry. Which, it's actually, it's raining, and it's been raining for lots of days, so it's actually very humid here, but it's, like, cool humidity. Not cold, but, like, you know, cool humidity, and I, I, I appreciate that. Oh, the moon has life. Uh, right then, greenhouse effect. Ah, it is unicellular, and it's terrestrial, so basically it's going to be like, not moss, uh, like algaes and lichens. This temperature is, it's very chilly. It's minus 13 degrees Celsius. That's not terribly cold. I mean, that's cold enough I'd wear my coat, but it's not like, you know, oh, freezing. Well, I mean, it's technically freezing, because that's below the freezing point of water, but I mean, like... A good average winter temperature here is between like minus 15 and minus 25. So, 
and then those really cold days where it's like minus 30 and then like this this summer or this winter when it got down we had cold snaps of minus 40 and minus 50 for like literally no reason because the climate patterns are getting slowly screwed up so we can expect more of that uh anyways temp atmosphere is mostly nitrogen bit of carbon dioxide and some oxygen i'm afraid to click info because that always breaks my game which sucks because i love the info tab but i cannot use it so I, I i really hope that's fixed at some point but anyways it's also organic which is nice what's the um gravity oh so this is a smaller planet what's the atmosphere composition pressure so it's a thicker atmosphere it's just cold temperate arid oh i suppose I suppose. Uh, yeah, this weekend, or this week, I've been mostly doing uh, just actually a lot of work stuff. Um, getting rocket stuff done. What else am I working on? Oh yeah, my turbine project. I'm getting that done. I have the turbines for it actually printed off and assembled. And I have the, the housing assembled as well. That whole thing took me about two and a half weeks to print all the parts. And it was quite the adventure but i got it all printed and i'm getting it assembled now it's the small scale hydro turbine i think i've mentioned it before that uh it's like a, a low profile run a river turbine i'm gonna drop it in the river and see if i can get uh get it to generate power but like in a test format like I'm, I'm actually i'm actually building the generator itself you know i have the magnets and, and all that so <laughs> that's it's mostly just a, a metric to see how well it's working efficiency wise so we'll see how that pans out. Go away. Um, yeah. Ooh, I also ordered the first dish for the radio telescope. I was very happy about that. It should be showing up. I have no idea when it's going to show up. I guess a few weeks, if I had to assume. I ordered it from Rona, which is like a Canadian Home Depot. Although we have Home Depot here too. Actually, it's more like Lowe's. I would have to say, in terms of company-wise. Uh, and aesthetically, it's like Lowe's. Either way, so I've ordered from them. Uh, it should. I have a Rona that lives by my house. I've had, there's a bunch in my city. This is a big city. So I have no idea where it's coming from. All I know is it's coming from probably a warehouse in here in Canada. Probably in my city, because uh, this is a big city, so it's a hub. So that'll show up at some point. It's a six foot dish, about 2.1 meters. And it's gonna be the first of three. I'm also working on the, uh, I like the actual receiver situation, like the, like the feed horn. I'm probably gonna use a coffee can at first because that's very easy and I have one right here. So, but I'm actually, I, I'll probably use that at first, but I, I want to make a, a better feed horn. So I'm actually, what I'm going to do is I'm probably going to order a custom uh, aluminum can to the proper dimensions that I want and then use that because why not? So I still need to do that. I still need to buy the low noise amplifier, which those things are unnecessarily expensive. Like it's this little bit of hardware, you know, it's, I don't know how to, it's, like, it's smaller than a credit card, but it's like $60 and I'm like, bruh <laughs> it's like why is it so expensive but whatever i i can i can manage that if you want to help out with that though uh i will leave a link in the video below for the radio telescopes donation page the kofi coffee kofi yeah whatever so if you want to help out with that so the dish will be showing up and all i need to do now is just get the assembly part all set up and I also need to contact my internet provider because my internet sucks and I'm going to need to get a better internet plan or have them fix my internet before I actually get this going so I can do it properly without too much problems. Because right now my internet is terrible. When I'm uploading a video, I can't use the internet. It uses up all the bandwidth. And it's, it's very unfortunate. Uh, if somebody's streaming a video, same thing, internet kind of dies. Well, actually, streaming isn't as bad, but uploading stuff terrible in fact uh these videos i don't think anybody has noticed but i had to turn up the bit rate in obs studios when i was making the cosmic ocean trailer because when i was putting it together uh it kept having that like that that, that grainy like kind of fuzzy look and i didn't like that so i bumped up the ooh, i bumped up the bit rate a whole bunch 
oh, let's go to the Mega Jupiter. And now, I don't know if anyone's noticed, but there's these videos when I upload them, they have far less artifacting and they look a lot better. But it also takes about three hours to upload a 20 minute video. So again, not sure anyone's noticed. Uh, I could probably turn the bitrate back down and reduce my upload times back to like 15, 20 minutes. But I kind of like the, uh, the better visuals. So I'm willing to put up with the two hour uh, upload rate for you guys and gals and everything in between. And I, I don't mind people don't appreciate it or not. <laughs> I do things mostly for me and ho hope for the best. So, if you have noticed that, then uh, good eye. Oh, look, it's the Milky Way. But yeah, so the, the bit rate. In fact, right now in the background, OBS is probably throwing up errors, telling me, uh, oh, bit rate's too high, because it's been doing that. And I just say, just deal with it. Like, just, just, just deal with it. Yeah, like, sacrifice your ability to process for the good of the video and the content. I should get a, new, a better computer at some point too, and I will, but not right now. <laughs> Other things I've been working on beyond the telescope is my rocket stuff. I have like a little test rocket that I've been making. It's gonna test some design principles for the larger rockets that I'm working on that are gonna be uh, mono, mon, mono, mono propellant peroxide and uh, rockets that will, sorry, <laughs> I got distracted by my cat for a second there. They're gonna be mon monopropellant rocket engines that use um, hydrogen peroxide as the fuel. Oh, blue, uh, blue star. And they're gonna be uh, recovered using passive rotor stability or rotation, like auto rotation. So they're kind of cool. I don't expect them to get terribly high. Well, it depends. Uh, the altitudes that I can achieve on those rockets will depend almost an, ooh, entirely on how much I can sweet talk my way into, regu into like regulations. Where, where's the other one? It had two. Oh, there you are. Because like the engine itself is a peroxide engine. So how it works is you basically take high proof hydrogen peroxide and you pump it through an aggregate uh, medium like like a, like, like a porous ceramic or a silver f mesh these are interesting planets and oh my and it decomposes them quickly into or it decomposes the peroxide quickly into like high temperature steam like water steam and oxygen so it's technically a steam rocket with clean exhaust and because it's a steam rocket technically I have to keep doing air quotes here. It falls into a regulatory black hole. Because here in Canada, uh, actually much like the United States, if you make your own rockets, you have to have certifications to make your own, like, you know, high powered solid motor rockets, like those really big, cool ones that go up, like, sort of, you have like one to four, I think, levels. And to build uh, liquid fuel rockets or hybrid rockets, you need tons of licensing and approvals, and it's a real mess. But steam rockets, because nobody thinks about them because they kind of suck they just fall off the deep end so i actually contacted transport canada and the canadian rocket association about this and i was like these these rockets are going to be running on peroxide they're technically steam rockets but they're going to be much more powerful and controlled and they were just kind of like they didn't quite know how to respond they were just like i guess it falls under experimental rocket but there isn't anything really in the books about that and it's like that's what i like to hear I always love skirting regulations by finding black holes. So th those are gonna be kind of cool. Um, but the altitude at which they're gonna reach, that completely determines, or that, that that's determined completely by what I can accomplish life, like permit wise uh, through Transport Canada and locations. But the second rocket that, um, that I'm working on, or the rocket program I'm working on is, it's kind of a shortcut or I should say a cheat code to getting to high altitude because ooh, an orange dwarf, what it is basically is a giant vertical balloon with a rocket engine on the bottom. That's literally what it is. Uh, I've, I'm custom making the balloon out of a thin ripstop nylon that's coated to be uh, gas tight. And the 
bottom of it basically can houses a rocket motor. Oh my god, there's a lot of stars here. It houses the rocket motor and your payloads. So what I'm going to basically do with it is it's going to be like a raccoon, which is a balloon-launched rocket. But instead of a balloon launching a rocket, it's the entire rocket itself is a balloon. So it's going to go up to however high it gets, anywhere from 30 to 100,000 feet. And then the, the rocket motor ignites and thrusts it up even higher. And since it's above most of the atmosphere, it'll have less drag and... Uh, also, it'll technically weigh less because it, it's positively buoyant to begin with, so it'll that'll, that'll help the engines go. And basically, just try to see how high you can get uh, by launching a balloon into the uh, upper stratosphere. <laughs> Aiming for the mesosphere, that's kind of always been my goal. But with this one, if, if I make them big enough, I could theoretically get them to go into space, like over 100 kilometers. And that's kind of a goal. But because I'm not breaking any rules like I'm using a balloon under a certain cubic feet of helium and I'm using a commercial rocket motor probably a G motor or an F or G so it's like there's nothing about this rocket that's going to be requiring regulation only thing is it's going to go obscenely high but within the bounds of both ballooning and rocketry so again, it, it also falls in a category of uh, Transport Canada and the Canadian Rocket Association have no idea what I'm up to, but all they can tell me is that it's technically illegal. It's technically legal, so that's what I like to hear. When I make the bigger ones that have like a like you know more helium in them, I'm gonna have to get like a permit from Transport Canada because any balloon over a certain amount of cubic feet of helium, you need to like kind of just get information. You, you need to get, like, basically get permission for. Just so you don't accidentally like plow into an airplane and uh, cause a crash. Actually, when I contacted Transport Canada about my other balloon stuff, they got back to me, and they even said it's like, oh yeah, you can do this and that, but make sure you have a radar reflector on it, and make sure that you keep track on air traffic, because uh, any damage at all that a balloon that I launched causes to an airplane, I have to pay for. And they even straight up just said, it's like, if you damage one of the engines on these planes, you're going to have to, like, pay millions of dollars to fix it. And it was just like, thanks, Transport Canada. I, uh, I already knew that, but thank you for doing that. And they even put an exclamation mark at the end of it, so it was like it was, like it was being yelled at me. And it's like, that was unnecessary, but all right, thank you. So, yeah, rockets. I'm actually hoping I can launch the, um, the like, the little Raven rocket because the two rockets like the peroxide one are raven and the balloon one are blue jay i give them corvid names or corvid eye names because i like those birds and the raven one um i have the little test rocket printed out and assembled i need to it, it, it's also going to use like f motors i think and uh i need to finish up oh there we go uh the rotor descent system because how it basically works is once it, gets to a certain, once it gets up to its altitude and it deploys recovery, instead of a parachute popping out, it's going to be a rotor blades that pop out. And it, they, they, they just free spin as the rocket falls and basically auto gyros itself down to the ground. Because that's always a fun thing to do. The idea is in larger rockets, you can make, you can make, you can make it like very controllable. So you can basically fly back a booster to a, a like a specific landing site without needing wings or powered descent. All you need is just the rotors to auto gyro as it descends, and then you can just control the rocket like a well like, like, like an auto gyro or like, or like a uh, an unpowered helicopter down to the ground. And originally it was gonna have legs, but I kind of gave up on legs. And I'm, what I'm gonna do is I'm probably just gonna put like coils like wire coils that pop out of the um, the fins or out of the base and just basically cushion it on impact with like metal loop springs because it's easier it's like I don't care about doing landing legs for it it doesn't really need landing. and even the larger ones won't need landing legs the important part is fly back to uh, to launch point so the rotors can do that but it, I'll, I'll make them just bounce on the ground on springs What's that? Ooh, Andromeda. Whereas uh, the Blue Jay rocket, the balloon ones, 
probably going to use a parachute, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make it that, that once it gets up to its peak altitude, it's going to vent some of the helium, but not all of it, so that it's still so that it's negatively buoyant by the time it reaches the like the dense atmosphere, but it still slows it down considerably. So I can use a tiny parachute <laughs> and just rely on passive buoyancy to make it descend slower. So that's what I'm going for. Just to save weight and to save space. So I give it a tiny parachute, like a drogue chute, but a lot of its descent is going to come from just the um, the airship section being just below uh, positive buoyancy or neutral buoyancy. And it's probably going to land balloon face down, so it's going to act like a big old airbag on the impact. One of the reasons why I'm using ripstop nylon instead of like rubber because it has to maintain its shape and it has to be strong and it's going to probably get beaten up a little bit. I'm actually going to print off um, some parts for that one. Like the first one's going to be pretty small, like 20 centimeters across. And poof, I don't know, a meter and a half tall. It's going to be fairly tall, but not very wide, but it's mostly balloon. But yeah, so yeah, rocket projects and radio telescope. If you want to help out with any of those, link below. But that's 21 minutes, so thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you have ideas for things for me to talk about, places for me to go, let me know in the comments below. I read them all. Boy, do I read them all. And uh, I'll see you guys later. Space.